let's move on to the next segment of today's program that will be a guest lecture on what is new in lipid management may i call upon the chairperson for that segment dr keith sir in dr shamita dasanayaka to introduce our valuable speaker Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I warmly, warmly welcome all of you for the next uh, guest lecture. Uh, I am Dr. Shamita Dasanayaka, physician in internal medicine. Uh, and my co-chair is Dr. Kisri Nguyenhaller. He is also a uh, physician in internal medicine. And uh, the topic is, what is new in lipid management? Uh, speaker is Dr. Anuj Maheshwari. Uh, may I cordially invite uh, Dr. Nguyenhaller to introduce the speaker. Thank you, Samita. Uh, Dr. Anuj Maheshwari, MD, FICP, FIACM, FIMSA, FACP, and uh, FRCP London, Edinburgh, Governor, American College of Physicians, Indian ch ch Chapter, uh, Executive, sorry, uh, Secretary General, Indian Society of Hypertension, Executive Co opted Member, RSSDI, National Executive, Executive Body. Professor in Medicine and me, Professor in Medicine, Hind Institute of Medical Sciences, Lucknow. Uh, he will be talking to us what is new in lipid management. Over to you, Dr. Anuj. On. Thank you, dear persons, for the kind introduction. And first and foremost, greetings from India. And I'm grateful, ACP, for nominating me as Global Ambassador for this conference, as well as I'm really grateful of my good friend Suranga and Dr. Kumudni for inviting me here for this wonderful conference. What I'm seeing and what I'm experiencing since from yesterday, it is tremendous uh, conference organization what I could first of see in the Sri Lanka for the first time. This is my second trip for the Sri Lanka, but second one is much experience rich as compared to the first one. In next 20 minutes, I shall be telling you about what is new in lipid management. But in the morning session, I got a very good lesson from Sri Lanka, one of, one of the oral presentation. I could know that in Sri Lanka, 80% people are being given statin for the primary prevention, which is really a very good thing. Because for primary prevention, the compliance rate for the statin is very, very poor in India. Whenever we try to start, for the first and foremost, many of the clinicians doesn't uh, have the courage to start for the primary prevention. But even if it is started looking over to the risk and all that, most of the patients don't continue those statin for the primary prevention. So let me come over to the topic, what is new in lipid management? We all know that dyslipidemia stands at top among CV risk factors and much more than the diabetes what we talk a lot. We are having conferences and conferences, volumes and volumes on the diabetes, but you can see it here, the lipids is much ahead on the occurrence of the cardiovascular risk factor and followed by psychosocial, followed by psychosocial. Neither diabetes nor abdominal obesity, third is the abdominal obesity. So it is also again an introspection required here. Are we really going into the right way for our addressing the population problems regarding the cardiovascular issues? If we look over a mechanism of dyslipidemia, we all know about the LDL cholesterol is a bad cholesterol, HDL is a very good cholesterol. And how does it work? Why it is bad cholesterol? Why it is good cholesterol? Because LDL cholesterol has a tendency to get deposited in the arteries. That's why it leading to the CAD or other peripheral arterial diseases also may occur because of what? HDL cholesterol is having a very good tendency to bring the cholesterol which is in different parts of the body and take it with it to the liver where it is 
again going to be corrected or may be removed from the system of the body if it is found in excess. Here we have got the two different uh, systems. One is that uh, exogenous pathway in which we get the cholesterol which is being received from the diet or food and it goes to the uh, arteries and later on liver for the biosynthesis of fats and cholesterol. Another system which is more important that is the endogenous pathway and this endogenous pathway is basically depends upon the HDL cholesterol. HDL cholesterol has to play a bigger role in the endogenous pathway and which is very shorter and lesser in the people, those who are living in this part of the world. We all are deficient in that HDL cholesterol because this is the cholesterol which takes a lot of excess of the cholesterol to the liver. At the same time, this also prevents the de novo lipogenesis. What is the de novo lipogenesis? In the era of the physical inactivity, in the era when we are not doing much physical efforts, most of the carbohydrate what we are taking is getting converted into the fats. This is called de novo lipogenesis and this de novo lipogenesis becomes responsible for the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease for which many papers have been presented since morning. So lower the LDL cholesterol, lower the risk of CVD events, this is well understood. Now question arises, how low is the low? Up to what extent we can go? In secondary pre uh, prevention for the patient, those who are at a very high risk, in the primary prevention for those patients, those who are at a very high risk, patients, those who are having the familial hypercholesterolemia. What is recommended? It is recommended to keep the LDL cholesterol less than 55 milligram per deciliter. Whatever is the present value, at least 50% reduction should be having at the one go whenever you are dealing with the very high risk patient. For the patient, those who are having the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, those who experience second episode of the vascular event in two years, they are recommended to keep their LDL cholesterol less than 40 milligram per deciliter. In patient with high risk, LDL cholesterol can be permitted up to the 70, moderate risk up to the 100, and individual, those who are at the low risk, they can be allowed till the 160. Now question arises, what are the guidelines about the primary prevention? If we find any patient is having the LDL cholesterol more than 190 milligram per deciliter, straightforward, no risk assessment is required, we should go for the high intensity statin therapy. Patient, those who are having the diabetes and ranging between the age of the 40 to 75 years, no need for the risk assessment to start a moderate intensity statin. But you ever think that this patient may need high intensity statin therapy, then risk assessment may be required. Age more than 75 years only on the basis of the clinical assessment and risk assessment. How shall we be doing the risk assessment? For that, the best thing which has been recommended by the American Heart Association, that is a CAC, coronary artery calcium. If this coronary artery calcium is zero, then you can uh, say that the patient is on the zero risk and do, no statin is required unless the patient is diabetic. If the patient, if the CAC is between 1 to 99, then it favors the use of the statin, especially after the age of 55. If it is more than 100, then again it needs high intensity statin therapy, depending upon the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk enhancer. So what are the basic guidelines for this? If the risk is 5% or less than that, only lifestyle modification would be sufficient. If it is ranging between 5% to 7.5% is called as borderline risk, then we can go for the risk enhancer assessment and risk discussion can be depending upon the moderate intensity statin therapy is recommended. Risk discussion, if risk if it is more than 7.5 but still less than 20% intermediate risk and in such situation you should initiate the moderate intensity statin to reduce the LDL cholesterol by 30% to 49%.
And if it is more than 20%, then initiate statin to reduce the LDL cholesterol at least more than 50%. So this is uncontroversial that statins are considered as the first line agents for the primary prevention of the cardiovascular disease after lifestyle modification. Now question arises, how shall we be deciding what is the high intensity statin, what is the low intensity statin, and what is moderate? The high intensity statin therapy is that which can bring the daily dose of the statin, can lower the LDL cholesterol on an average by approximately 50% or more. If daily dose of the intense, uh, statin therapy brings down the LDL cholesterol on an average by approximately 30 to 50 percent, it is called moderate intensity. If it is less than 30 percent, then it is called low intensity. Each one millimole per liter reduction of LDL gives more CV events reduction according to number of years in trials and comorbid conditions as well. Now the question arises, what happens with the insulin resistance? When we talk about the LDL cholesterol, of course, it is the similar picture, either we are having the insulin resistance or not, but insulin resistance creates much more problem with hypercholesterolemia and LDL cholesterol because of the lower HDLC and higher hypertriglyceridemia. A small density LDL cholesterol is that which is responsible for increased atherogenicity. It increases binding to the arterial wall protoglycan. It increases the susceptibility to oxidative modification. It reduces the LDL receptor affinity and by it greater propensity for transport into the SE space is, is called that increased atherogenicity. Low HDL cholesterol risk is definitely taking us towards some more cardiovascular adverse events which are independent of the LDL cholesterol level. It is not the level of the LDL cholesterol which is responsible when HDL cholesterol is low for the cardiovascular event. When it is normal also, then lower HDL cholesterol is sufficient to cause the cardiovascular events. Strong heart study suggests that high triglyceride, low HDL, was associated with a 1.54 fold greater hazard of the coronary heart disease and 2.13 fold hazard of the stroke in participants with diabetes. Now, question arises, what are the treatment options available to us? Lifestyle changes and treatment of secondary causes, this is always a first option, it must be done. But the pharmacological therapy which are available to us, obviously if the patient is the diabetic, he should be treated for the diabetes, then lipid management should be done. First option, the statin, followed by azetimibe, PCSK9 inhibitors, fibrates, niacin, omega-3 fatty acids, and saroglitazar. Lower the better. 1% decrease in LDL cholesterol reduces coronary heart disease risk by 1%. If we talk about who are the categories or who are the patients in which statin should be started immediately whenever they are coming to your first contact, patients who have cardiovascular disease, patient with a LDL or bad cholesterol level 190 milligram per deciliter, patient with type 2 diabetes who are between 40 and 75 years of the age, Patient with an estimated 10-year risk of the cardiovascular disease of 7.5% or higher who are between 40 and 75 years of the age. Residual cardiovascular disease risk in major statin trial has been well mentioned here where you can see all the trials which has been done with the statin made before as lipid, care, HPS, VOSCOPS, AFCAP. They all are showing they are definitely reducing the CVD risk, but this CVD risk is not completely reduced. In placebo, it is 28%, and statin arm, it is 19.4. Similarly, you can see in the lipid trial, 15.9 with the placebo, 12.3 with the statin arm. Now question arises, what happens with this window period? 
what will be happening for the residual cardiovascular risk. CHD events occur even in patients, those who are being treated with the statin. What options do we have if it happens to the patient, those who are already being treated for the hypercholesterolemia or dyslipidemia by statin? The extreme risk category, which are having the high prevalence among stable coronary artery disease patients, and an emerging treatment gap in achieving LDL cholesterol less than 55 milligram per deciliter. Means your all efforts are not being able to bring the LDL cholesterol less than 55 milligram per deciliter of your patient. And patient is lying in the stable CAD category, then it is a patient who is candidate of additional therapy, may be azetimibe addition. More than half of all patients with stable CAD are at extreme CV risk and very few achieve the LDL cholesterol level less than 55. Using maximally tolerated high intensity statin combined with azetimibe, if necessary, is imperative to bridge the treatment gap. Now, question arises, when to use the PCSK9? Patient, those who are having the clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and substantially elevated LDL cholesterol level. They are the candidate for the PCSK9. Patients should be on the maximally tolerated statin therapy. Ideally, with concomitant azetimibe has also been tried to them. Or those who are unable to tolerate statin in the highest possible dose or azetimibe, then they should be kept on the PCSK9. Apart from this, another category in which the PCSK9 should be preferred, that is the familial hypercholesterolemia. Those patients who are having the clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease but substantially elevated LDL cholesterol level and not getting corrected or not being able to tolerate statin with azetimibe therapy. So if we categorize this, that people, those who are having the LDL cholesterol more than 100 with additional indices of the risk severity like familial hypercholesterolemia, diabetes, severe or extensive atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or rapidly progressing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Despite being given the azetimibe, they are not being able to bring their LDL cholesterol down one, less than 140. They are the candidate for the PCSK9. Now, we should talk about fibrates. Lipid modifying effects are mediated primarily by the interaction with the PPAR alpha receptors. And here we can see whatever the evidence we are having with us about the fibrates and PPAR alpha receptors against that primary lipid abnormality was a low HDL which was supposed to be addressed by these fibrates. But primary outcome in high risk patient could not be achieved in majority of the trials. At the same time, we were also having the limitation like increased chances of the risk of gallstone, abnormal liver function test, increased serum creatinine level. Omega-3 fatty acid has also been tried and number of evidences are there for the CVD outcome. Studies with omega-3 fatty acid have produced even more inconsistent results than trials with fibrates. Niacin has also been tried but the larger studies suggest that niacin cannot improve angiographic endpoints and reduce cardiovascular events in a statin-treated patient. No difference in the primary endpoint of the major vascular event between the niacin and placebo group. No reduction in the primary endpoint of the major vascular event. At the same time, many of the patient has also developed hyperglycemia. Let's talk about the saroglitazar. First approved dual PPR alpha gamma agonist approved for the treatment of the diabetic dyslipidemia and hypertriglyceridemia in type 2 diabetes uncontrolled with statin therapy. Powerful TG lowering, good glycemic control. So this is the only PPR alpha gamma agonist which not only controls the hypertriglyceridemia which has been proven with the press 5 trial as well as press 6 trial but also has a significant improvement in the glycemic status also. Effect of saroglitazar 4 milligram on triglyceride and non-HDLC both were quite encouraging. 
After three months, we could also see the improvement in HbA1c. Effect of sarugitazab 4 mg on glycemic parameters after three months in the form of the fasting plasma glucose as well as in postprandial glucose could also be quite encouraging. Effect on body weight has been found to be not changing. Sarugitazab administration did not lead to the weight gain. No serious adversaries were reported. So summarizing the talk, CVD is yet a principal cause of the morbidity and mortality. Atherogenic dyslipidemia, which includes the high level of the small density LDL cholesterol, low level of the HDL cholesterol and high triglyceride level, is again a problem to be addressed well. Low HDL cholesterol and high TG, both independent CV risk factors, statin mainstay therapy in dyslipidemia, Residual risk may be a concern for which agitimibe can be used or PCSK9 inhibitors in, parent, in patients with maximally tolerated statin or statin intolerant. Currently, in addition to lifestyle changes, there are not many options. Niacin or omega-3 fatty acids have inconsistent data. Fibrates have their own limitations despite being pure PPR alpha agonist. Creatinine level goes up more myalgia when added to statin. Sarotazar may be having some ray of the hope as far as being in the PPR agonist effective for lowering triglyceride, uh, increasing non-HDL, and APOB with additional insulin sensitizing property, what we could see with the use of Sarotazar. Thank you very much for your kind listening. Thank you, Dr. Anuj, for that excellent lecture. And we can entertain one burning question we are having one minute left behind. So if there's any question, it's open to audience. Yeah, in the absence of uh, questions, may I cordially invite uh, Dr. Neunhaller to hand over the uh, certificate of application to Dr. Anuj. Thank you very much.